this is Metal Mike, and in this episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast, we talk some Britney Fox with their killer bassist, Billy Childs. We talk about the first three Britney Fox albums, what went right and wrong with their career, and the possibility of an original member reunion. You gotta check this thing out. Billy, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast, man. How are ya? I'm good, Mike. How are you, man? I am doing great, man. I'm excited to talk about some Britney Fox with you. Well, there's always always something happening, it seems, you know? <laughs> what have you been uh, up to lately? What's been going on? Well, not much, really, man. We we did some shows a few years ago, and uh, we just couldn't quite get enough going on to keep it rolling, you know? So we haven't been doing much of anything, and then, of course, we had the whole COVID thing happen, so I don't think anybody was doing much of anything for a long time. Uh, so we're just looking to... Looking to see who's still interested and who wants to do anything and trying to get some things together with, uh, I don't know, man. We, we might be talking to Dean at some point. It's uh, kind of hard to say. I don't want to say too much at this point because it's still kind of up in the air. Mm-hmm. When was the last time you actually spoke to him? Uh, the last time I actually spoke to Dean myself has been years, really. I'd say at least five or six years. Mm-hmm. At that point, did he express any interest of doing anything? Or uh, Yeah, actually, he did. Um, so, well, you know, it may have been a little bit longer than that, actually, man. It may have been, may have been closer to six or seven years. Uh, <laughs> he was the one. He got together. Me, him, and John got together. We were all in the same town at the same time. And because uh, I was doing Get the Let Out, John was doing Doro, and Dean was, I'm not sure what Dean was doing, but it was something out of town. But we all ended up in Philly at the same time, and he wanted to get together. So we did get together, and we talked about the possibility of doing something. He seemed very into it, and we were very into it, too. Uh, but then John and I were both pretty busy, and we didn't hear a whole lot, and it just kind of dissolved, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. But here we are. It's kind of a new time now, you know? I don't know what anybody's up to at this point, so I guess we'll find out. Yeah, yeah, I'm well excited to see what could happen, man. How about Michael Kelly Smith? I mean, it was funny. I actually I hadn't seen or heard of him in years, and somebody actually interviewed him. I want to say in January. I don't know if they ever really asked him about getting Britney Fox back together, but he talked a lot about Britney Fox, and he still got the 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 hair. You know, he looked he looked good. So I don't know what uh, what his plans are. Oh uh, yeah, well, I, I'm I'm assuming I'm hoping that Mike would be interested in it. Um, absolutely interested in it um and i i think he probably would be we just haven't talked you know we haven't uh it, it's not really that far along yet but uh, mm-hmm. we are in the process of trying to contact him and uh really that's step number one right there i know i know john is uh into it i know i'm into it and i'm can say with you know pretty good guess that mike would be into it yeah you know it's it's a real shame that you guys haven't been able to do much over the years because there's a big demand for for britney fox and it's it's really good music that should be out there you know when i look at the cruises and the m3 festivals and all these gigs that go on it's like britney fox should be there you know well we did do a couple of them you know we did uh, a few years ago we did m3 we did uh uh, Monsters of Rock cruise. We did a couple big shows out in California. I can't remember what they were called, but they were, you know, they were big festivals, mm-hmm. you know. And it's something we we've, we've always wanted to be a part of that. You know, it's not that we haven't wanted to be a part of that, but uh, John and I were always so busy with different things that that was always an issue. Yeah, it was just uh, getting enough work to keep us to keep us moving mm-hmm. with that. You know. It seemed to be an awful lot when we were doing the one-off shows. That was they were fun and they were great to do. Uh, but we'd fly all the way across the country and do one show, you know, right. and then have to fly back to the East Coast. And it just became kind of ah, we have to get more work than this, you know. Um, so it, it just kind of fell apart through those reasons, really. When you say get the let out, so what do you do? You play in like a Zeppelin tribute before? Oh yeah, man. That was uh it's one of the it's one of the bigger tribute bands, uh was one of the bigger tribute bands in the world actually. I was with them for about five years and uh we were doing we were selling out five, six thousand seaters nice. pretty much every night. Yeah, so that was a good gig, and that ate up a lot of my time. I mean, obviously, we would go out on tour for a couple months at a time. Uh, it's hard to do anything else, you know, Britney-related when you're doing that. Same thing with John with his Doro thing, you know. Uh, it was always hard to get enough time off to actually dedicate it to that because, you know, that thing takes a whole startup period as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to get together and rehearse and, you know, just get everything tight, get an operation down, you know. I mean, you got to grab a sound man somewhere and 
things are booked so far in advance, you know. Yeah, it was kind of tough to do the both, actually. Probably every bit as much for John as it was for me. So I heard through the grapevine that uh, the two first two Britney Fox albums just got uh, reissued together, like in a pack together in the UK. That's pretty cool, man, to hear that uh, you know that's being reissued. Oh yeah, that's really cool, man. I'm I'm happy about that because it, it lets us touch base with guys. Uh, you know, back in the beginning when Britney was first started, Kerrang, that big uh, English magazine. Uh, Dave Reynolds, Malcolm Dome, dudes like that. They were they, they were really in our corner, man, and they helped us out a lot. And and that's kind of who this is. I I, I just did an interview with them. Uh, I guess a month or two ago, they're putting together some kind of booklet. I think that goes with this release. Oh, cool. I don't know about yet, but uh, it should be interesting. I mean, and it's cool because I really like that uh, that second album. It's nice to see that get a little more. I just get a little more notice because I always like that album. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about these albums. So if we we'll start with the debut. I mean, the look obviously very glam, but the music man had a lot of balls. That I mean, you listen to that one. That's a straight up rock, hard rock record. Oh yeah, it absolutely is. Well, the band was just a straight up hard rock band. You know, we we never probably to our detriment. We never really thought much in terms of will this be a hit? This would be something good to write for a hit. We just did the same thing we always did and. Somebody had a riff, and it was generally Dean in those days. We would make a song out of it, and if it sounded good to us, you know, it just got included in the set list. And that's kind of how we operated, man. It was all pretty organic, which I dig about it. And it was, for that time period as well, it was a really heavy band, man. It had a, a very solid, solid foundation to it, you know? Yeah, definitely um, rooted more in the 70s than, than the 80s, you know, because a lot, a lot of the bands from the 80s, you know, they're playing a million notes and they're they're shredding and all this crap. Yours, you guys had a lot more feeling, and it was said it's, it's definitely more rooted in Kiss and ACDC and that kind of stuff, especially on the first album. Oh, yeah, de- definitely. I, I couldn't agree more, man. I mean, that was just, you know, that was just a combination, brother. We got the right guys together at the right time, and we all played the same way, you know? Like, we all complimented each other. Like, I would say with Tony Dester, our first drummer, he was a great behind-the-beat drummer, just like our second drummer, Adam, was, just like Johnny D was. You know, Mm -hmm. all three of them had that in common. And Kelly Smith just had a nice, thick tone, man. It was really, he was, one of his strong points, man, was really dealing with volume. A guy could play at such loud volumes and be controlled, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And then the way I play, my style in there as well, it just, it just always fit really well. So we got lucky in that respect. Yeah, you know, I mean, the single, it's funny you guys talk about, you know, you weren't really trying to write hits, but you had some hits on that album. I mean, Girl School and Long Way to Love were both real big songs. I mean, the album went gold, so you guys definitely had some uh, success. Oh, yeah, well, we, we did know that we had a couple that, that, you know, were definitely inclined to be hits, could be hits, you know, but they were just written... They were just written, man. We we didn't really have that in mind when we wrote them, you know. We didn't think that, oh, Long Way to Love, what a great hit this will be if we can make <laughs> this happen. We just wrote the song, and then as we played it more, it became obvious to us that, like, wow, this is a really good pop song, man. It could be a hit, you know. And Girl School, that thing kind of, um, it was pretty obvious which way to go with that, right. you know, as far as the video and, you know, what that was going to be. I, I will say in mind, that, yeah, we, we did know what certain songs were going to do, uh, but we didn't go out of our way to attempt to write those songs. Uh, like even Dream On, uh, off of the second mm-hmm. album, which is much different than a lot of other things we did. Uh, that just came about very organically, man. It wasn't, we didn't say like, wow, we need a nice mid-tempo mm-hmm. rock tune here to be a hit. You know, we just never thought along those lines. But then once we would have the song and have it down, I think that's when it would start to enter our minds that like, wow, we have something here that could do something, you know? Yeah, one thing, you know, that I love about the first two records, obviously, is Dean's voice. I've always enjoyed when a singer, you know, has two voices, right? So he's got that clear voice. And, and Long Way to Love is a good example of this. You know, he sings the, the verses in that clear voice. And then, what you know, then he's layering over top of himself with the screech you know and i just it's so cool how he can use both of those voices and at times it sounds like it could be two people and i just i love when some a singer does that yeah i dug that as well man and i really liked that uh on the second album i thought dean started to go more with his real voice i guess we'll yeah. call it that, as a to screen and i think had we stayed together i think you would have probably seen um 
she's seen more of a smoother transition to that because we were kind of headed in that direction. I know Dean absolutely was, and I liked it myself. Uh, like over the second album, there's a song in there called Long Way to Home where he sings in his normal voice, which, man, I, I love. And I saw that as a good direction for the for the band to head into, like like that one. There was one called Angel of My Heart that was also that type of tune. And not to say I don't like the other stuff either, because like I do, like I love the way he sings in motion and songs like that. Yeah. But yeah, man, I, I, I think I know he thought, and I, I thought too, that it really was time to move more into that direction. And I wish we would have had more of an opportunity to do that, you know? Well, that's my jam right there, man. Angel in my heart. I, I'm always posting that one on Twitter. Uh, I talk about it with, with, to, to anybody about it. I, I love that song. I really think that song should have been a single. I think you could have made a really cool video with that song, and 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 I think it could have been a hit. That's my opinion, dude. I think uh, now actually here's something. It's kind of annoying. We did have, you know, we did the Hair of the Dog by Nazareth on that album. Yeah, awesome. And we have been doing that in our live shows. Oh, pretty much pretty much since the beginning uh i don't know why we didn't put that on the first album actually but at any rate we had it for a second album and right as we broke up we were only a couple weeks away from doing the video for that oh. uh, which we were hoping was going to be like that year's girl school so to speak you know nobody else had done it at that point and we had a good version of it uh it, it wasn't to be but i think if that did happen and that came out and and that kind of pick the album up a little bit i think you might have been able to hear things like angel in my heart come out as singles which never really had the chance to do that we um when that album came out we, we misfired a little bit and we were originally supposed to go out on the kiss tour it was a really big deal we were all psyched about that and the first song we did was standing in the shadows and it really kind of died at mtv mm -hmm. and then you compound that with the fact that we on release we went to europe with Alice Cooper for about two and a half months, and we weren't even in the States. So we had a video that pretty much died, and the band wasn't even on the same continent, and our American sales suffered because of that. So we ended up losing the Kiss Tour because Oof. of that, and somebody hotter got that. But, uh, yeah, it was just, you know, as I say, a couple things happened to us there that if, if one of those doesn't happen, maybe history's a little bit different, you know. I, I think the... Uh, I think the stand in the shadows was supposed to do really well at MTV and that was going to hold us over for a couple of months while we were in Europe. And then we were going to come back to hopefully a big tour. But as I say, just uh, everything that could go wrong went wrong. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. it's funny. You know, you talk about hair of the dog and, you know, obviously Nazareth cover, but I, I really, I think you guys did better than Guns N' Roses. I know Guns N' Roses did it, you know, probably, I don't know, was it like five, six, seven years after you guys did it, like on some cover album, but I always look back to the Britney Fox version, man. It it was killer. It is killer. Thank you, man. I, I tell you, I think that version was heavier, you know? Yeah. And I think our version was heavier. Uh, we were, but when I listen to us now compared to a lot of the other 80s bands, our peers, so to speak, I think we definitely, yeah, I agree, man. We have more of a 70s tone to us. Mm -hmm. uh, we were all those kind of players. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we all grew up on was Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, you know, um, ACDC. So so we, we just did have that 70s feel, and it was a very, very heavy plotting band at times. Man, yeah. I used to really love that about us. A lot of fun to play that stuff. You know what I've noticed as a fan. I mean, I'm I'm 45, so when and I was buying these albums when they came out. So shit, I was you know I was a, a you know real young kid, 12, 13 years old or whatever. And I think the problem, not the problem, but what happened was is is it was MTV. It was very visual. So you you listen with your eyes, right? So you look at Britney Fox on that first album, and you think '80s glam band. You know what I mean? That's what because you're listening with your eyes. And now, as an adult, you know, definitely got a lot more musical knowledge and experience under my belt. You know, that's where I really pick up on it. Like, wow, it's really. There's a lot of heavy, heavy 70s influences, but like I said, as a kid or watching it visually, you just think of the 80s, you know, oh, it's 80s glam, 80s hair metal, whatever. But I think in retrospect, yeah, you can really hear all those influences. Like I never realized like how much 
Michael Kelly Smith probably was influenced by Ace Freely. Like he's more in the school of Ace Freely than in the school of guys like you know Warren D. Martini and George Lynch who are doing all these you know crazy solos. You know, oh, he absolutely is, and he was the perfect guitar player for that band because that's the kind of guitar player that we needed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We we needed a guy that played like Mike, you know, and we needed a guy that played like our different drummers did. And we needed a guy that played like I did. I mean, a, a busy bass player wouldn't fit into that band at all, you know? And well, as I say, we just, uh, it was more luck than anything that we were just all on the same page like that. We never really planned that out, I don't think. We were just, uh, Mike and Tony had just left Cinderella, and I was always a Cinderella fan. Mm-hmm. And Dean needed somebody, so it just we, we were all kind of the more well-known players in the area at that time, so it made sense that the three of us would get together and be Dean's band. But it really was, like I said, just a stroke of luck, man, that we were all the same type of players and that our sounds and our tones complemented each other so well because I think at that point in time, I don't know how many other bands like really thought in terms of tones and styles. It seems like just, um, you know, guitar players would play a lot of notes, you know, and everybody would do a lot of this. I, you know, and a lot of these bands were good, uh, but I don't know that they really had the same thing going on that, that we and a few others did. You know, like Enough's Enough was always a great band, man. Oh, yeah. I think those guys always fit together. I could just hear those guys, the way they played, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and more than some of the others, you know. And Warren was always a band like that too. They always they sounded good together, you know. Oh yeah, you know that's a, it is funny. I mean, al- certain albums and Britney Fox is probably a, a strong example of that. I mean, albums grow on you over time. If an al- you know if an album is really good and it stands the test of time, it grows on you. You know, the Britney Fox debut and Boys and Heat. That, I mean. I think over the years I've just kept listening and listening and I just I love those albums. It's funny you say Warrant because I think the debut of their album is just I never once again, I never really realized what a great songwriter Janie Lane was or what a great vocalist he was. You know, I mean he just kinda he you know, he important band, but over the years you just keep listening and you're like, Wow, really amazing stuff. You know, I think it took me till Dog Eat Dog. Uh, oh. was that their third Yeah, that's was awesome. The my God, that album was great, man. And Janie was so talented, man, you know? And like, on the first album, they were a little bit like Britney, actually. Mm-hmm. So on the first album, you could hear that they were still growing, you know? Yep. Uh, Britney, on our first album, we had only been together at that point a little over a year. Wow. And that was the first batch of songs we ever wrote. So we were we were growing uh, at that point. I think the same way as a band like Warren uh, was, you know? Uh, I think you would have. I think you would have heard us get better you know mm-hmm. and i think we did on the second album to me there's a big difference between the first and the second i think the second sounds a lot more mature yes and would uh i would have been very curious to hear what a what a third or a fourth album with that lineup would have been yeah yeah lyrically it's it's more mature and musically as well yeah i agree with you yep i definitely can see the growth now what happened so during this album i mean the band just kind of fell apart right toward the the end of the run what happened with the uh, with the boys in heat yeah what do you mean uh, well we had just as i say man we were really expecting to get that kiss tour i mean that would have been that would have uh, smoothed over any problems that we were having. <laughs> right. We were having. Yeah, right. The kid. Yeah, that would that would do the trick, man. Being with Kiss, that would be awesome. Yeah, that that definitely definitely would have would have done the trick. We just got off to a really bad start with that album, man, and things just kind of snowballed from there. You know, as I say, we just uh, if we if we don't go to Europe, we probably get a second a second single going faster than we did, uh, mm-hmm. which would have probably been Dream One. And we would have been on tour over here, and things would have picked up pretty well, I think. But as I say, it was almost, we went almost three months. Uh, we released that album, our first video died, and we weren't playing anywhere in America. So it just kind of, we, we lost all our momentum, you know? And that kind of built into personal problems that were with Britney always just slightly, slightly under the surface, you know? Sure. As good as we got along musically, we didn't get along that well personally <laughs> at that particular period in so, time. You know, but a lot of bands are like that, man, you know? Yeah. So it had to be kind of right. shocking, right? So, I, cert- I mean, I've, I've definitely heard the story, I think, from Johnny. I mean, at a certain point, Dean's like, I, I got a new band and, and I'm leaving you guys. I mean, that had to have been pretty devastating. Yeah, well, obviously it was, man, you know? I mean, because at that point in time, too, we didn't see the end and nobody really did. Nobody saw the... Uh, 
the end of the 80s era happening right that fast right. You know, things, things were still really strong and uh i guess because of that we were we were devastated obviously but we really did like our chances of recovering if we could find the right guy you know and once again it took us a little bit longer to find tommy paris than what we had hoped for i mean it took us almost a year mm -hmm, i guess mm -hmm. I mean, it was worth waiting for because nobody else would have done what he did no. for the band. You know? But during that time period, from the time Dean left till the time we got ready to do Bite Down Hard, the landscape had completely changed. Yep. You know, regarding the whole the whole glam thing or 80s bands or hair bands or whatever you want to call them. I mean, we still, it was still big at that point, but obviously it was on its way out. You know, and just from the start of that tour, the Bite Down Hard tour, till about a year later when we came off of that, it was all grunge at that point. And in the beginning, it was about 50-50. Yep. You would go, it was weird, man. You would go play rooms. It wasn't like it changed over all at once, you know? Like, you would play rooms, and as that tour went on further and further, we'd start to notice that half the room would be wearing flannels and not really <laughs> interested in us at all. And the other half would look like the people that had always been there, yep. you know? Yep, yep. And then by the end of it, I remember I played a place in Florida. We we played a place in Florida, and it was called the Good Food Sports Pub. And they sold burgers and they had tables. And I was like, "Wow, this is over, huh?" You know. <laughs> right. But uh, it did. So it, once it well once the '90s thing did kick in, I mean, it happened really fast. But in the beginning, it really was a lot of push and pull with that. You know, you never knew what kind of crowd you were going to get. Was it going to be our crowd? Was it going to be a crowd that wasn't into us, we just couldn't even tell. DDR Music Group is the premier glam, sleaze, and hair metal label. They've got a kick-ass roster consisting of tons of bands that you remember from the 80s Sunset Strip. Bands like Electric Angels, Blondes, Sweet Savage, Cats and Boots, Jailhouse, Jet Boy, and many more. Well, maybe you're just looking for something that you've never heard before, some rare or modern hair metal. Well, they've got that too. Go discover rare and hard to find glam, sleaze, and hair metal CDs at ddrmusicgroup.com. Hey guys, this podcast takes a lot of time and effort. I want to do more in depth projects on here, but I can't do it without your help. Just Google 80s Glam Metal Cast on Anchor. Once there, hit the support button and you can donate 99 cents, $4.99, or $9.99 a month. Your support will ensure that this podcast will be rocking out for years to come. Yeah, you know, bite down hard. I mean, well, there's so much to talk about. I mean, I think at the end of the day, if this album could have came out a year or two earlier, I mean, it would have been huge. You know what I mean? Like I said, it's another one of those timing deals. You know, if, maybe if it came out in 1990, you know, in January, you know, you might have a different uh, trajectory of how it would have went. But, uh, it, it, yeah, it just sucks because it's a great album. And, once again, it's another one of those albums that, over time, people realize how great it is. I mean, people, you know, the average, you know, the rock fans knew at the time, but like everybody's on board now. Everybody knows Bite Down Hard was kicking a kick ass album, just released at the wrong time, you know? Yeah, it was really, you know, it's kind of ironic, I really, man. In, in the beginning, it seemed like everything we did, timing wise, just everything seemed to be on our side, you know? We, we couldn't make a misstep if we tried, actually. But then after that first album, it seemed like everything we did was, uh, it, it couldn't have been more of a mistake, hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, how that happens or why that happens, I guess, you know, some things just are what they are, and that's the way it happened for us, you know? Yeah, and Tommy Paris has a, a, a really cool voice. I mean, he doesn't sound, you know, like Dean. He's got his own voice, but he still has that rasp and that screech that he can do. So it's it's not a totally different kind of voice, because sometimes, I I won't mention some of the bands out there, but there's some bands that replace the singer, and I'm just like... I can't do it, man. It just it just doesn't work. It doesn't fit the music. But he definitely fits the music. Well, that's why it took us so long. I mean, we were it, it was uh, we were looking for a kind of a kind of a strange animal, man. Because obviously, we needed a guy that could that could do what Dean did. We needed a guy that could sing those songs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition to that, we needed a guy that could also do what Tommy did. You know, I mean, we were really looking for a guy that may not have existed. But we got very lucky and found him. Uh, I, I guess, I don't know, I guess other bands in that situation are facing the same problem. They need a guy that can do the old stuff, but they mm -hmm. also need a guy that can bring something to the table. I mean, we just didn't want to take a guy that could imitate Dean, because then where do we really go from there? Exactly, you know? yeah. 
uh, we needed we needed a guy that could come in and like really make that gig his own and and be incredibly talented, which which Tommy was. And I don't think very many people disagree with me on that. You know, no, no, definitely. You know, so many cool songs. Obviously, Louder was the first single. That's an amazing song. I love like Closer to Your Love, Look My Way. Those those are cool, catchy songs, man. Great songs. Oh, uh, I always liked those two, man. Those are always songs that I really loved to. I think Ladder was the first song that Tommy and I wrote, actually. Okay. Or it might have been over and out. I'm not sure. But it just clicked. You know what I mean? It just clicked. And have we been maybe two or three years earlier with that? You know, I think we probably survived Dean leaving, and I think we probably keep doing very well, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. But the, the timing, I mean, really, for a band that lost its singer like that, and who was really known at the time as Dean, being Dean's band, I don't think you could really expect much more than what Bite Down Hard was, you know? I mean, we were really congealed as a band at that point. And uh, just speaking of the three of us, you know, we've been together for a few years at that point with a lot of touring under our belt. And I, I think it uh, was probably surprising. A lot of people probably thought it wasn't going to be as good as it was, you know? But I think Bite Down Hard's a great album, actually. It's funny when I post stuff on Twitter, and, and like I said, a lot of a lot of people that are that follow my page love Britney Fox. The, probably the two albums that they the, they always say that are my favorite. This is what I see the most. I see it's either Bite Down Hard or the debut. But I'm telling you, man, me and you, we're, we're Boys and Heat guys, man. I'm always gonna go Boys and Heat as my favorite. <laughs> oh, I, I love that album, man. That is just such a. You know, I, I would like to hear Bite Down Hard with a little more of the production that was on Boys in Heat, actually. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm more of a fan of that that heavy, big smash and low end that Boys in Heat had, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. I love Bite Down Hard. It's a great album. Um, but as far as having what the first two did in that aspect, it doesn't really, it doesn't have the heaviness that those two did. I mean, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's why people like it so much, you know? But, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> that i just i like uh, all three of those albums i like yeah no they're they're solid man they're solid now with tommy is, is he kind of done with britney fox i mean do you ever foresee him doing anything again with the band oh uh, i don't i don't know man i don't really think so i, I don't know if any of us are going to do anything with it again right. uh, actually at this point i mean we're we're trying to see what's out there and to see what uh i mean also too what we're dealing with right now with this corona thing I, yeah i don't know when things are going to get back to normal you know, they're not really normal here on the East Coast. They are to a degree, but um, but nothing like it was. So I think everybody's in kind of a gray area there. Uh, I don't know. Are any of the cruises going out or anything? I don't even know. No, no, no. I think it's planned for 22. Most people have pushed out everything big to 22. I see Guns N' Roses is going to do the European Tour 22. So most people don't have faith. Billy, that they can do a big show right now. You know, I don't think it's there. Yeah, that that was what I thought. I, I know there's going to be an M3 this year. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah, that's happening. So that's that was kind of surprising. I was surprised by that. Yeah, it's very surprising to me when I heard about that. I was like, wow. I just thought, like, like I had heard too that things were just done until 2022. You <laughs> right. know, uh, and I guess they are for the most part. You know, but. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to see where things uh, where things play out as far as what uh, we're doing and and what we want to do, what we what we're able to do. You know. Mm-hmm. Now, some bands. I mean, you you've seen these kind of bands. I mean, okay, I'll give Queensrÿch as an example. You know, they couldn't work anymore with Jeff Tate, so they found a guy that sounds spot on, exactly like him. I mean, if things don't work out and you got a couple guys that are still hungry to do it, I mean, would that ever cross your mind to to get somebody who's spot on? You know, with that sound or, or no? Nah, at this point, man, I really don't think so. I mean, for Britney to be viable, it was never a band that was. It was really big enough to just plug an unknown in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and plan on getting good slots. You know, for, sure. for us to do well, we we have to have uh, pretty close to original lineups. You yeah. know, yeah, and and that's really what would make it interesting to do anyway. You know, to just go out there and you know try to try to do something with like what I did before. I mean, that was just mainly to keep the name of the band alive sure. uh, when I tried that. Yeah. But I don't think any of us want to do that. I mean, if we're going to do it and get the good gigs, it really has to be a pretty much original lineup, either Tommy or Dean. Uh, you know, I think it would probably be bigger with Dean, actually. Sure. So yeah. that's pretty much what we're hoping at this point. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Well, man, when we put this out, that's the official invitation to all the past members, man. Let's, let's get it going. Let's get it back going. <laughs> 
I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be real nice, man, after all these years and all this bullshit and everything, you know, it would be really nice to, to kind of send it out with the original band, you know, right. with the guys that started the whole thing, you know? Yep. I agree. Hopefully that that would be really nice and I'd love to see that happen and I think I think a few of us would like to see that and we'll, you know as I say man we'll just have to see where the where the chips fall. Definitely. Well brother man this has been a great talk. I, I love talking to brother Brittany Fox. I I'm sure you do too. Anything you want to say to all the fans <laughs> that have followed you all these years? Oh just well I'm I'm glad they dug us man. I'm glad they I'm glad they liked Brittany, you know. It was really cool. It was what we were all trying to do and uh, I'm just really happy it turned into giving me a career and just what I always wanted to do, you know, and I know for a fact the rest of the band feels that way too. And I hope they get a chance to see us do it one more time. I do too, man. Well, hey, Billy, man, this has been an honor talking with you, man. Like I said, I've been a big fan for many, many years, so it was a pleasure chatting about music with you. Uh, Same here, Mike. Same here, man. I really enjoyed it. Well, that was great chatting with Billy. Make sure you subscribe to the 80s Glam Metal Cast so you don't miss a thing. Rock on!